All right, everyone, welcome back to the next video. So like I was telling you last time, I'm trying to do a few new, th new things here. So this one is gonna be an upper molar. We're gonna show you how we deal with troughing for the MB2. You can see large carries on this case into the pulp, starting to have symptoms. Um, take a look at the photo here coming up and just a lot of food <laughs> that I had to pull out of that tooth. Um, not the prettiest tooth in the world, but we're gonna save it. So let's talk about how we're gonna do that process. So first things first, let's get that carries out of there. With a broken down tooth like this, I still like to take it out of the bite using that wheelbarrow. That's the first thing we're always going to do. I just don't want to have any issues with this tooth breaking down in the interim. For this dentist, she does like that I build the tooth back up. And even still, with this large caries, without having cuspal coverage, I, I'm a little concerned about losing a piece of enamel here and there. You can kind of you say, ah, oh, it works for a little bit, but oh, this is a larger guy as far as the patient and so i'm worried about possibly fracturing the tooth at this point so i'm going to start going through the process clean that all out and we are now going to run through that uh carries with the aper so surgical length eight round um carries was a little bit larger than i anticipated it went over into the distal you're going to see this here in a second that um, i was trying to keep that contact intact if possible it makes for a much easier restoration and root canal in general but as we are starting to get down inside there you can see the carries it's it's really soft it's very velvety which is not what you want to hear for your tooth and so it just scoops up really quite extensively so expose the pulp at this point but i'm mostly focusing on using that round burr for the carries i don't like using round burrs to access teeth it gouges the floor quite extensively so what i'm doing here is just using the eight because that's what gets me the best tactile sensation for removing any decay and you'll see i'm pretty much going until i can't feel anything soft anymore with the high speed i know we talked about this last time i do not like using the slow speed for this process it just moves the patient's head around too much and it's so bumpy i can't really feel what's soft or what's not so you kind of just have to rely that the pressure that you're putting on the tooth isn't going to cause you know extensive removal of good tooth structure so at this point everything felt nice and solid here just checking it with the endo explorer once again i know for vital pulp therapy this is a big no-no but this tooth is no longer going to be vital in about 30 seconds <laughs> so i'm going to go and finish up my axis here using that nice round tapered diamond you can see the diamonds actually are stripped off of the edge of this one. I didn't notice until it wasn't cutting. So I'm going to switch it out here in a second. This is what that cut is. Brand new diamond burr, and now it's actually doing its job. So at this point, I know there's an MB2. I have looked at the cone beam. You'll see uh, slices from that in a minute. And what I like to do for uh, my MB2s is start brushing off of where the MB1 is. This is a pretty open canal case for me. Um, it's not really calcified. And so what I like to do is almost draw a line between your MB1 and your palatal. And along that straight line, line you're going to move slightly off to the mesial and almost make like a comma shape so you can see that there where the straight line along the side there this is going into our mb1 a um, little bit of a bend there on the file when i first went in there there's where the mb2 is didn't really get too too far down maybe three four millimeters but sometimes that's all you can get you can see there's a lot of bleeding from the palatal as well when i went into the palatal the bend was accentuated so i fixed that there go back in now with the distal buckle and at this point, we need to remove that coronal pulp tissue, just get it so I can see. Uh, I find that sometimes just the, ripping that out, and it's always cool when you get the whole pulp tissue out like that. So <laughs> I had to show that off because it's always fun when you, you, you get a fair amount of pulp tissue coming out of that tooth in one solid piece. But this is a really straightforward root canal, except for this MB2. So at this point, I'm fine taking the 2006 down about to the length of where my 8C went. So I'm not worried about ledging or anything at this point. We're only going down about four or five millimeters before I hit a stop anyway. So this just removes that coronal aspect. We go in here, rinse with a triton like we've talked about, just to get any of that vital tissue out of my way so that there's no more bleeding and I can start to work on that MB2. Um, there was a lot more debris in this tooth than I kind of anticipated. You'll see this especially between the isthmus of the MB1 and MB2, so you'll see how I handled that in a few minutes. But at this point, we're going to be now working up uh, that MB2, kind of clean everything out. And so I like to use the 1704 at this point. Oftentimes, this is a small enough file that if there's any you know s curves or weird things going on with the mb2 itself the 1704 will kind of just straighten it out and get get you down to where you need to be there was a large clap of thunder if you heard that in the background i'm not sure if my microphone just picked that up we've been having weird storms in reno lately <laughs> so i can't control the weather um, as far as the recording so I'm going to go back to the case now. Uh, so suctioning everything out. At this point, I know I'm not down MB2. I know I need to do some more work, but I also want to know exactly what my lengths are going to be. Generally, your MB2 is going to be close to the lengths of the other canals. You, it's the one that can be slightly off, especially if it exits to the palatal. Um, I've seen it where they're you know two, three millimeters shorter than the MB1. 
But sometimes if you're struggling with the MB2, it is just, it sometimes just feels good to go back in and take care of, do, the, do what you know how to do. Take care of the other three canals, get them all cleaned out. And I found that even just that rinsing out with the bleach or whatever you're using for your irrigant, that process of going through there actually cleans things out really nicely. And then it's often easier to do your MB2. So if you're struggling, it's okay to take a pause, focus on the other canals and then come back to it. So that's kind of what I'm doing here is getting my lengths. So as you can see, those dropped pretty much right away to working length. Um, this is a pretty straightforward case as far as everything, except for that MB2. They're all right around 19520 give or take as far as the working length and if you watch once we go into that mb2 that's what we're working on right now you're going to see we're not doing quite as well unfortunately <laughs> the patient needed suction there that's why there was a little bit of a pause and going into the mb2 you can see i hit a brick wall um those the 25 millimeters the yeah nope it's not going down there whatsoever so we only got in a few millimeters and at this point going to try to go back in with a smaller file so i like to start with the 8c I have no use for 6, 8, or 10 K files. They're too flimsy. They don't do anything. So I only have C versions of that. The only K file that I have in that size is the 25 length 10 that I use for length. Um, and what we're looking at here is just trying to work it up, see if I can't find a stick, anything to go into. I can't. So I'm going to start troughing here. So I use that really skinny diamond that we talked about, the 014. Um, I think it, I might switch to an 012. Looking at this final x ray, you'll see it in a few minutes. Um, I'm not loving how much I had to tear off to actually get inside there. It's accentuated because the tooth is rotated slightly for the final x-ray, so it does look worse than it actually is. When you look at it clinically, there's still tons of tooth structure left. But I'm definitely a fan of conserving as much tooth structure as possible, and I felt like uh, maybe with a slightly smaller burr we could do that. Anyway, what we're trying to do here is start by moving towards the mesial. So when these canals move, they usually start by moving towards the mesial, and then sometimes they'll also move... Um, um, Buckley as well. So what I'm going in through it through here now is with that EG3 burr. That's the endo guide from SS White. Great burr. Um, a couple of my friends helped develop it. I like the ones that work in high speeds. If you haven't figured out, I really don't like using slow speeds. And so what I'm going to do is gently start to uh, you know, kind of brush this. It's not a great... Um, apical cutter. It's more of a sideways brushing. And I know that in general, your MB2 is going to be, if it's if you have trouble getting down it, it's usually going to be towards the MB1. There are cases where it goes off of the palatal and those things happen. <laughs> as soon as I find one, I'll record that for you as well. Just know that all the rules are thrown out the door when it comes to MB2. So at this point, we've troughed down a little bit farther and taking that eight back in there, seeing if we can't pick anything up. And really, I'm still just hitting a wall, maybe going in one to two millimeters. I know I'm in the right spot because you can see some liquid coming up. And so it tells you that there's something going on there. So we're going to go back in, trough again with that same diamond. And this is pretty much my process is I do a combination of the EG3, use the 850 skinny diamond to go in there. Sometimes I'll use ultrasonics if it's really bad. But in general, I most of the time you're going to pick it up within the first two to three millimeters meters as you trough apically. And my high-speed ampies can handle that more effectively, I think, than a um, ultrasonic. If I have to go really far down, that's when I start to use the ultrasonic because you can do some custom bends and things that you can't do with a spinning instrument. The other thing is when you go in with that EG3, if you can't get to the 8C to go in, it's sometimes nice to go back in with the 850 like I just did and completely flatten this whole area out. And I'm learning new things in DaVinci. I actually was able to pause this. So this is very cool. So along this area, that white spot is where that whole isthmus of the MB2 is, or the MB is. That was where the MB2 was initially. And you can see how there's that line along there. You're going to find that canal somewhere along that line. And you'll see me pick it up right here. So what I'm going to do is come in here with a 6C+. Plus. I like the C plus for this because it's stiff, it's sharp. If there's a canal, it's going to find it. And you can see how I'm kind of poking at all these areas along the canal, trying to see where I go in, kind of midway between where I was looking, where the MB2 seems to be the best spot. And I'm going to go in right away with that 1704 that we've used before. And this is just going to help pull that tissue out, get me down. And you can see I actually drop pretty much all the way down. Now, once you drop down, you still want to go back and clean out the rest of this isthmus. So right now I'm kind of in between where MB1, MB2 is, opening that area up. You'll see me move back and kind of try to clean up the palatal, see if there's anything over in there. And I 
kept going back and forth because there is still a little bit of a white streak on the palatal side and kept trying to go back inside there. I'll show you what we ended up doing to finalize that. But at this point, it's looking great. So we're going to rinse out that area in between and we'll dry it and go ahead and go back and get length again. These are a type two canal system. They do join up. However, I do still like to measure it just to make sure that we're at the right length because with a type two, they can have different curves, which will change the length slightly. Um, but as you can see, it drops down beautifully to length there, exactly where we want it to be. And I think these were pretty much the exact same. Like I said, it is type two, so they're more than likely going to be the same, but it's still a good idea to go back and double check here. So I'm um, getting that working length. Yeah, so a little bit shorter, it was about 18.5. Um, coming back in now, we're gonna do our final shaping here with the 17.04, uh, just because we haven't actually spent any time on the other canals. <laughs> this is one where I was uh, just started to work on MB2. If I had gotten frustrated, that's where I would go and clean and shape the other three canals, just get those ready. Um, but very happy with how this all turned out. You can see there's actually a decent amount of bleeding still in between those MBs. And that's because that isthmus area is just so intense. This is another case where, you know, gentle wave laser would be a great thing for that enhanced irrigation um a straight canal is it going to make a huge difference you might get a few extra laterals and it'll look pretty but on a case like this that has multiple canals inside a single route with the isthmus that's where those devices absolutely shine to clean everything out i found that the Triton stuff does work pretty well in these cases because it does seem to have almost an effervescent effect. Um, and when you combine it with the endo activator here, it really does create a lot of bubbles. If there is any uh, organic material still inside there, you can put bends on the endo activator tip, by the way. So that's what you saw me just do off camera is put a slight bend in there and that helps get into, you know, harder to reach areas. I didn't want to, you know, it's funny when you look back at how far we've come from endo, the, this is, still was an access that probably in dental school I would have gotten a fail on because you can't see all the canals at the same time but I still feel like I took away just a little bit too much structure uh trying to trough for that mb2 and so you can be the own judge and let me know in the comments what you think so at this point I'm going to start drying everything and once I dry it is a good chance to look back at it so I took another screenshot there and you can see that little white dot off to the right hand side on the palatal that's where I'm going to mark it here in red in just a little bit that's where I'm concerned there might be an extra canal inside there. You can have three MBs. It's somewhat rare, but it's more common than you think. So I'm going to go back in and try to clean that out again. Um, just a little troughing here with that 850 burr to help make sure there's nothing going on. And this is actually zoomed in at 25 times. So this is as far as the microscope goes, in case you're wondering. Um, that's not zoomed in at all through the software. That's just how far it actually can zoom in. I don't like working that far because my when you're zoomed in that much, it, it any small movement, you're out of focus. There's no, it, it becomes a little bit difficult, but it's nice if you're looking for things to have that option to zoom in. So this, I think, is at 16 times right now is what we're zoomed into. So a little bit of troughing here just to see if maybe that opens up. Um, once again, I, I you could have used the EG3 here. That would be a great option. But I find that with that 850, it almost creates a flat surface that you can push against more effectively with a 6 or an 8 than the EG3 because the EG3 is shaped like a point and your K file or C file is going to want to get stuck in that area. So I'm hitting a brick wall. Um, at this point, what I'm going to do is poke around a few more times, just confirm. And you can see there's still some bleeding. Even after all that we did in there, there's still some bleeding in between there. So I'm going to rinse this out here in just a second. Um, want to get all that nastiness out. Uh, so if there's any bleeding, I always go back in. I want to make sure the tooth is completely dry with no pus, no bleeding, no sinus fluid, nothing else coming in there. You want it to be as dry as possible to get a good seal. Also, we will be doing the squirt technique as usual for this case. And if the tooth is not completely dry, the squirt technique fails miserably. Please learn from my mistake. You have to have it be as bone dry as possible because if there's any liquid, it's going to heat up or cool off that gut portion almost instantly. And you're going to get a very short fill, which is not what you want to have. So I'm still you know, debating back and forth, is there going to be an MB2, MB3 here? What do we need to do? And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to dry everything. And there is a break in the video that you'll see in a second. I cut it out. But at that point, I open back up the comb beam just to take a look at it. So I have a couple slices that I'm going to show you um, and kind of show you what I was thinking as far as is there a third MB here? If there is going to be one, it's going to be pretty broad. So looking at that tooth, you want to look at where the distal buckle is. You can see the MBs are kind of centered around there, which is how it was in the case. Also looking at the coronal cut here, 
it really doesn't look like it's wide enough to support three MBs. So at this point, I'm happy to fill. That's the still photo of the two MBs. You can still see that little white isthmus in between there. And then this is what the, you know, distal buckle palette will look like. And from here on out, it's pretty much the same. You've seen this multiple times. If you want to stop the video here, it's not going to hurt my feelings. It'll hurt my YouTube algorithm, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and what we're doing here is just same fill like we normally do for squirt technique, uh, H plus on the paper point, go back in, recapitulate with a 20K file, just make sure that we don't have anything in the way, especially on those MBs where we had so much debris. I'm gonna spend a little extra time there making sure that we are all the way in. Um, the nice part is with this more open canal shape, you know, I didn't really have to do too, too much shaping on this tooth uh, besides the MB2 itself. And so that 20 just drops down really nicely. So we're gonna come in here with the beta and do the squirt technique. So you guys have seen this multiple times. If you have the first time, to the channel, welcome. <laughs> but this is the squirt technique. Go in, inject the gutta percha, uh, compact it down with that nice nickel titanium um, plugger, backfill the rest of it up, and pretty much do that throughout the rest of them. Um, you know, as far as this tooth, the MBs, they're uh, it's sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're hard, sometimes it takes no time at all, sometimes it takes forever. I mean, I, I, the, the, there's no rhyme or reason to how long it's going to take or what you need to do. Just be patient, realize that it is important what you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of people will say, Scott, you had to trough all that tooth structure away and it was a type two. Does it even matter? I've had so many retreats where all I have done is missed MB2 and all I've done is gone back in and cleaned out the area that should be sealed. It's a type two canal system. I've cleaned out the MB2, left the other three completely still and completely as is, and they came back completely fine. Um, so I do think it matters. It does matter finding anatomy. Um, when I first started, I worked at a big clinic and we had almost 100% recall. It was incredible. So you get to see very quickly what worked. Um, the major failures that I had were Carrie's cases because they never came back and got the final restoration. A uh, couple of cases I probably shouldn't have attempted from a vertical root fracture standpoint and a couple missed uh, missed anatomy. Um, so I had a couple where missed an MB3, um, stuff off in no man's land that you wouldn't really expect. So at this point, obturation's over. Gonna go here with the Pac-Mac. On this case, I was able to keep everything small enough that I feel completely comfortable going right away in with the Pac-Mac. And I only have to go down about halfway, make sure that we don't have any issues with the um, obturation. If you have any voids, this will get those out super quickly. Um, it is a very nice technique. One thing you'll notice is look at how that Pac-Mac is pushing the gutta percha out of the MB1 canal. And that's because they do join up. So the way that I found to deal with this is you kind of have to flip back and forth between them as you're seeing. And then you come in with the plugger here and also flip back and forth and condense one and then the other because that pressure will push one up it's kind of a balancing game of you don't want to just do all at once you have to go back and forth between the two of them so this is another case where if you're uncomfortable with it you could totally put a cone in one squirt fill the other there's a bunch of different ways to do this i found that for these type two unless it's a Unless they join really high and it blocks me out, it's usually best just to squirt fill it. I don't have to do it in a separate cone. For a case like this where I have troughed, what I like to do is fill up that area with gutta percha. So that's why there's so much gutta percha there compared to the rest of the teeth. If you're a fan of using F5s, that's kind of what an F5 looks like. <laughs> so it, it does seem huge when you compare it to the other canals, but that's what we used to do all the time. And the reason I do this is your C factor as you go farther down into, and yes, I did just bring up C factor. I am that nerdy. It does start to have a big issue and you can't really get good bonding. Um, if you don't have larger pluggers in your kit, the back end of a Glick is perfect for this. So I do have bagged on the side, some other sizes. That's what the check film looked like. Really happy with how everything turned out nice and conservative. And so we're going to go in and start filling up the process. Anyway, if you don't have a larger uh, plugger system, you can use the back end of a Glick. That's what I was just going to say. And that way you don't have to keep an extra thing on there. I like to have my kit be as condensed as possible. So there's fewer things that we have to sterilize, fewer things for the staff to know. And we try to always update it. You know, every six months to a year, we go through and say, hey, what could we change? Do we need to take anything out? Um, one of the most recent things we did is changed. We put the plugger in the actual kit because I used to have a kit of all four of the BNL pluggers and I used the green 99.9% .9 of the time. So it really didn't make sense. Um, so we're going to go ahead and build the tooth back up. Like I said, this dentist wants me to build it up for her. So it makes for a nice and easy crown. 
using the blaster. Um, I'm always, like I said last time, always intrigued by what is actually stained, indicating the presence of bacteria and what's not. I like using this because it gives me a visual idea of where I need to do more blasting to get a better bond. Um, on a case like this, you'd think that with giant carries and it was all super soft, you would have, you know, spots everywhere and it really wasn't that bad compare that to the premolar i posted you know the i don't even know when this thing's gonna go up so maybe let's say a few weeks ago <laughs> and that will and that one looked terrible and had you know no decay on it so really interesting how this all works um once again we talked about this last time i like to start with the enamel for my etch process selective etching is as i said very very difficult to do but giving the enamel a little bit more time with the etch is going to help your bond giving the dentin a little less time with the etch will also help your bond so kind of that's the process here give it the nice 15 seconds um sec assistant comes in you can see that suction took out so much of it even with a rubber dam you do not want to have any etch get into their mouth it's really sour it's not a good experience for them so have this assistant suction it out air dry everything's looking super nice inside there and we'll get a photo here um once again that that air abrasion works so well for getting just beautiful looking pictures um so I'm looking great there and then we're gonna build it up. So the rest of this two case is pretty straightforward. Um, if you stuck around this long, I, I love you, thank you. <laughs> Maybe you wanna know a lot about you know restoring teeth, um, but uh, you can watch a bunch of my other videos as well on this. So clear fill SE for the um, bonding agent. Um, the new stuff did just come in the mail, so I'm very excited about that. It contains silane in it, so when I'm restoring any porcelain teeth, I don't have to silenate the teeth, which is great. Um, going in with the bond, air thin, light cure, just like we normally would. On cases like this that are a little bit larger, sometimes you do have to go back in. You want to have everything covered, so you may find that one dip is not enough. You have to go back in and out a little bit more, but in this case, we're looking good, and I think I only had to do one centrics tube, so it really wasn't too bad. Speed up the light here process, because no one needs to see that for 20 seconds, but it's looking good, and while I'm doing this, the assistant is hand mixing the build it, so it takes her about that 20 seconds, um, give or take, to mix that stuff and then hand it to me, and so one of the keys as far as being efficient and getting this you know, done in a timely manner is to make sure that both of you are always doing something. So when I'm working, you know, right now what the assistant's doing is she is cleaning up, working on the note, whatever it may be. It doesn't take that long. She has the glick at the ready because I've already told her that's what I'm going to need next. And you can see the passing is, it's almost like they anticipate what's going to be needed next because we've done it so many times. Having standard work is the key here. So using the glick, smoothing everything off. One thing I did do here is I wasn't sure if I was going to open this contact or leave it closed. Um, the I wasn't planning on breaking the contact. Contact. Unfortunately, the carries broke it for me. And so what I did there is use the Endo Explorer to create kind of a space and get an embrasure that looks decent. Um, you'll see what I end up doing in a second here. So starting off as normal with a wheelbarrow just to flatten everything out. I zoom this in for you guys because I forgot to switch to uh, 10 times. I was at four times. So that's why it looks a little grainy is unfortunately these cameras are just 1080p. Um, thankfully for my computer, they're only 1080p because 4K would be a nightmare. But what we're doing is just smoothing off any spots. I want to get down to where I left it before coming in now um i tried to do the barrel wear but it really wasn't working so just take the rubber dam off and it makes it so much easier to get inside here and start smoothing this this off for you so what we're doing here is just starting to do the prep um as far as the smoothing off sharp spots that were created by that flat disc, getting that central groove nice and smooth. You can kind of even get into the embrasures and make it so that they can floss a little bit better. Um, it's a very useful bar in this case. And so you can see me playing around with the distal. Um, you can almost feel the hesitation of, do I break this? Do I not break it? <laughs> and I ended up deciding that it, it, we needed to open it up. It, it didn't look good. I think it was going to trap food. Um, did a little bit more work off camera just that I just cut out, but go back in with that nice big prep burr and just flatten this area out and i'm happy i did actually you can see there is this little extra area of enamel that kind of stuck out there getting an impression in that would be near impossible so if you just flatten this off create that space for the restorative material in between the teeth it's going to be far more cleansable um the these CAD cams that they use, they don't like curves, and so making it flat makes a huge difference as far as that. You give them a proxy brush, it heals up just beautifully. In this case, we didn't really even cause that much damage to the tissue, so that will probably be back to normal in a day or two. So looking good there as far as the final. Um, and once again, it, take a look at that. It looks like I really was quite conservative, but then when you see the x-ray that's coming up here in just a second, it does look a little more aggressive. And so I'm going to probably play around with a couple different burrs. If you have any re recommendations, drop them in the comment below. 
Um, and you can see, nice and conservative shape. Really pleased with how this one turned out. Uh, I'm gonna try to record a few more MB2 videos. I have a cool retreat one that I'm in the process of editing. I had one where I had to take a file out that a dentist um, accidentally left. So if there's anything else you guys would like to see, please drop a comment. Otherwise, thank you so much, and I will see you guys next time.